The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. Thank you very much. The title changed a little bit, and I do have to tell you that looking at the objectives for this session, I don't think this is going to meet any of them, but hopefully you'll find it interesting. Anyway, uh, we use the old title in the program, which was the Technical Council on Forensic Engineering, and the last couple of years we are now the um, Forensic Engineering Division. And maybe start off a little bit talking about the activity of forensic engineering and um, and forensic engineers and so forth and how the uh, the division within ASC has involved has evolved and some of the products that may be useful to you. We've had some excellent discussions over in this session, the previous session, on uh, how you evaluate structures. I think it gets a little bit tougher to evaluate a structure when it's just a twisted pile of steel and concrete on the ground. I believe this is the uh, the ruins of Lombiance Plaza. Uh, under investigation. And in forensic engineering there are generally two parts and uh, some people will focus a lot more on the first part which is actually the process of carrying out an investigation and trying to figure out what happened. And then of course you have the other part which is potentially uh, testifying in court and where the term forensic comes in that it's actually feeding into the legal process in terms of your findings and that's where things can really get interesting when you get to have a, um, a very talented attorney spending hours in a deposition trying to make you look stupid. And uh, in, in the mid 80s you go back and look for example at engineering news record and you could say that uh, perhaps forensic engineer um, at times would, would have a negative connotation to the point where attorneys would say, what does it say to us about the ethics of your profession that I can go out and hire somebody to take pretty much any position that I want? And, and to some extent, unfortunately, they may still be able to do that. And so the work of the division was, well, how do we go about fixing it, fixing this image? And I was at, the, um, at a conference in Stockholm, and we had a committee meeting talking about this, saying that uh, maybe forensic engineer as a noun is not a very useful term because most people don't do that. Maybe focus on what forensic engineering is as an activity because there are some people who do nothing but forensic engineering but, but maybe not focus on that as a noun. And of course the critical part of that we're getting the area of failure investigation. And one of the things we did within the division is what's a failure? Obviously, Lombiance Plaza, a lot of twisted metal and concrete on the ground is a failure. But we've seen some other ones that aren't really as dramatic, performance of false word of expectations. Although I do kind of have to wonder that if a, for, a parking garage with a 40-year design life is at 47 years and maybe not serving anymore, maybe, maybe that's seven years past expectation. I don't know. And, and failure investigation goes back a long, long time. Some of the original uh, geotechnical bearing capacity theories from the Transcona and Fargo Grain Elevators, an uh, interesting repair job, job if you're going to try to make that repair elevator, that grain elevator vertical again. And of course, the Leaning Tower Pisa, where the objective is not to fully repair it because nobody would go to piece it to see a non-leaning tower, but it does have to be stabilized to the point where it doesn't fall over either. So kind of an interesting balance in terms of repair. But again, this goes back to the 1800s, to the failure of the Tay Bridge, the failure of the Ashtabula Bridge near Cleveland. And since I lived in Cleveland for 12 and a half years, I learned how to pronounce Ashtabula correctly. Early, you know, showing that when you go from from wooden trusses to metal trusses, sometimes you get things wrong. The uh, Tay Bridge replaced by the much more robust fourth bridge on top, and then the Quebec Bridge one and two, a complete failure, and then a failure during construction of that. And of course, we have learned from Tacoma Narrows about uh, this phenomenon of aeroelastic. 
So, okay. So, so what then, if we're going to define forensic activity as a committee, as an activity term, it's about applying engineering principles to legal problems or things that may, so the failure investigation is part of it, investigations, analyses, reports, dispute resolution, a lot of what we focus on the division is information dissemination. And uh, the predecessor division, the Technical Council on Forensic Engineering was established in 1985. And 1970 to 1985 was a very, um, let's just say it was a period of, of employment for many in the forensic engineering field. We had lots of failures of completed structures. The Teton Dam failed during filling, the uh, Hartford Coliseum, uh, the Post Auditorium, Kemp Arena in Kansas City, the Hyatt Walkways, well known in Kansas City, Missouri, and the Mianus River Bridge. Hartford Civic Center in Connecticut, uh, arguably the first computer aided failure, uh, overconfidence in computer models and so forth, and I think an excellent example of not paying attention to building behavior. When the deflections are twice as big as what you expect, maybe it's time to think about repair. Uh, Kemp Arena roof fell in, and of course the, uh, the well-known um, collapse, Kansas City Hyatt Regency due to that walkway failure, and uh, the fail of the Mianus Bridge on, on I-95, dropping a section of that, basically a pin and hanger failure. So okay, so we've got a lot of completed structures failing during this time. And also during the same period, a lot of construction accidents. 1970, Commonwealth Avenue. Three years later, uh, Bailey's Crossroads, the Skyline Plaza Apartments in uh, Northern Virginia. Uh, the cooling tower under construction of Willow Island, West Virginia. Uh, some other arenas, Harbor K condominiums and a freeway ramp in East Chicago. To me, what was particularly troubling is, is the patterns and understanding the patterns. So you had Commonwealth Avenue, followed by Bailey's Crossroads, followed by Harbor K Condominium, all punching sheer failures, and somewhere along the line, don't really seem to have picked it up. This is um, Skyline Plaza, some of the remains, and that particular ramp. So um, there were some congressional hearings about whether we as engineers are really doing our jobs. There was an early attempt at a uh, failure database at the University of Maryland. This was a very, this was a time in which uh, National Bureau of Standards uh, got involved in some of the investigations and wrote some excellent reports that made its way into, I think, ACI documents. And there were a lot of things outside of ASCE. And then within ASCE, developing first the Committee on Forensic Engineering, looking at ASCE membership, and then starting the first couple of activities and building together the committees that would later become the, um, the technical council. And what we thought was the need to disseminate failure information. And a lot of that has been done through conference sessions and some various symposia. And since 1997, I'll talk a little about the Forensic Engineering Congresses. Some guidelines, some monographs, the Education Committee, and the Journal of Performance of Constructed Facilities. The Congresses were pretty much every three years starting in 1997, so once we figure out where it's going to be, you're invited in the one for 2018. Up until Washington, D.C. in 2009, I, I advocated for publishing the proceedings as books. Unfortunately, since then, they've been published as CDs. Uh, I don't know how long that technology will be around. My computer doesn't have a CD drive anymore. You know, paper, paper's a pretty reliable technology as far as I'm concerned, but the great thing about these congresses is this is the place that practitioners who did investigations and do repair projects, this is more or less the only place they ever publish. So many of these things you will find published only in the Congress proceedings and nowhere else. A few later maybe made it to the journal, but in a lot of times people who are doing this kind of work don't really have the time or motivation to, uh, to, to, uh, to publish more. We have some other publications and books, and there are, in fact, we've documented a lot of videos, internet sites, and other resources. So then we just change our name to the division, and the purposes are essentially to try to figure out how to get information out to reduce failures. 
inform engineers about failures and the patterns, and also how do you go about, on the one hand, conducting investigations, and then what about the ethical practice of uh, forensic engineering? And we do that through our committee structure, talk a little bit about it, we'll skip over the awards committee, obviously they give out awards. Uh, I, the, the education committee, though, I managed to get this uh, in, into their mission statement, the idea of promoting failure literacy, which to me is a understanding an engineer should have of what types of failures are our patterns of failures. In a way, what is the building or bridge telling you by its behavior? So how do we improve the risk? And we've given a lot of workshops, both nationally and internationally. Our current projects are trying to develop, first of all, we, we published a monograph of, uh, of short case studies, and we're currently working on sums of failures of steel structures and concrete structures. And the cover, the original cover looks like that. There's also a um, dissemination of failure information committee that also publishes monographs and really works on preparing our Congresses. I have a separate committee that's looking at not on how you carry out failure investigations and um, bringing in things on, uh, on non-destructive techniques. So again, uh, those are tools that may be applicable in looking at things for repair. I, I alluded earlier to this issue that we have of concerns about ethical practice of forensic engineering. And so the Forensics Practices Committee uh, has, has really focused on the competent and ethical practice of forensic engineering through first a set of guidelines and then a second set of guidelines that talk about things like the standard of care, you know, not necessarily for structural engineering per se, but the standard of care for carrying out an investigation and the ethics that should apply and, and how you operate within the legal forum which is a, an interesting environment for many of us, and sometimes we forget that the ethics of the attorney and the ethics of the engineer are diametrically opposed. If an engineer, I mean, if an attorney is not an advocate for the client, the attorney is being unethical. If an engineer becomes an advocate for a client, as opposed to simply trying to figure out what happened, then the engineer is being unethical, and it uh, can lead to some interesting conversations about why you don't necessarily want to have the findings the attorney wants. Our latest committee, which I head up, is is about trying to establish liaisons with other company, uh, other countries, on how they can develop forensic engineering uh, within their own countries. Our latest delegation was to Guatemala, and again, we got into this you know, forensic engineer, forensic engineering, what do we call it, and how do we maybe define the term so that it doesn't become a negative? And I think over the course of a day of conversation, we have some in interesting things about that. And again, we've had a lot of, uh, a lot of delegations of various places to, to work with them really and try to um, improve uh, locally that particular business of forensic engineering. And then there's also a committee uh, on practices to reduce failures that maybe look at specific things like fatigue cracking. Uh, the, the, uh, the first photo I showed of Lambiance Plaza, if you're not familiar with lift slab construction, I'm just going to say that that severely reduced the use of lift slab construction in the United States. And this particular committee came out with a monograph on how you could basically on how you would properly engineer lift slab construction, account for things like the flexibility of the columns while you're jacking the slabs into place. Probably our, our greatest outreach is the Publications Committee, and their main product is the Journal of Performance of Constructed Facilities. It is, a, it is the Forensic Engineering Journal of ASCE, but it's also the place within ASCE that really focuses on repair, on repair case studies, on non-destructive evaluation. Uh, we realized, I think, kind of early on that if we only focused on forensics and failures in the journal, it would be a fairly thin journal and it's a very thick journal. And, uh, and so we do publish a lot of, of case study papers on repairs and so forth, either specific or they may be um, sometimes you make them anonymous by disguising where they were and what happened, and you just talk about the engineering principles involved. If, um, if you're 
worried about getting unpleasant phone calls from your lawyer later on. This is one of the first products of the division, or the council. Uh, the editor was Ken Carper of Washington State University for about 35 years. Uh, he also put together a lot of the original material in this presentation. And I, thinking that I was stepping down as chair and going back to the faculty at Cleveland State and would have lots of time on my hands, I took on the editorship of this journal. And then I got a new job at Oklahoma State. But anyway, it's, it's a lot of fun. And it's, it's, uh, it's a, if, if, if you are looking to publish case studies, it's an excellent venue. And, uh, and there are a lot, wide range of publications over time. Let's see, the three on the right are some of our proceedings of the Congresses. And again, those are some very interesting stories of, of failure investigations and often of, of repair. And the guidelines for failure investigation have to throw in a plug for my book from ASE Press Beyond Failure. Um, all proceeds go to the Norman Lynn DeLott Honeymoon, Second Honeymoon Fund and the Joe and Isabella DeLott College Fund. Uh, it's got about 40, 40 case studies. And uh, really working with my colleagues in the division has helped a lot with that. And uh, pretty much that's the work we do in the, uh, in the forensic division. I kind of hate to show this slide to contemporary students because it doesn't look like a computer anymore, but uh, uh, you know, it goes to show that when you're analyzing a 3D space trust, if you think it's braced, it may not be. So, questions? Thank you very much. Thank you so much.